started. Uh, a quick just point of information for the students that you know, they have a meeting right after Grand Rounds today, so if you would appreciate your expedited leaving of the room so that they can get it cleaned over, cleaned up and turned over. Uh, Dr. Hartnett is our speaker today. She's going to be talking to us about ROP and the role of VEGF in neuroprotection and maybe reminding us of the zones and sleep as well. So <laughs> thanks a lot, Okay, thank you, Russell. And thank you every for everyone for coming. So I'm just going to uh, speak a little on ROP uh, and some of the work in our laboratory as well regarding VEGF signaling and neural protection. So, well that's interesting. <laughs> Yeah, well, let's, let's just go ahead and I'll try to tell you what it says. So we have a, a 24 and 3 7 week, uh, 580 gram gestational age girl who was a twin, she's twin B. She was delivered by emergency C-section due to fetal bradycardia. And her APGARDs were uh, four and seven, so that's one minute and five minutes. Uh, she was given um, surfactant for respiratory distress. Um, so at 32 week post gestational age, that's when she had her first eye examination. Um, this is what her RECAM images showed. So again, this is just an image contact for a premature infant with optic nerve and vessels. And no ROP stage was present uh, according to the examination. So that was at 32 weeks. And follow-up examinations were performed by pediatric ophthalmology. And then at 34 to 35 weeks post-gestational age, she had this examination. So, so what are the zones and stages of ROP in these eyes? So um, Brian, yeah, <laughs> yeah can, you, uh, can you give me an idea of, you know, how would you describe this? Yeah, so you're looking at things like that. Left eye? Okay, that's okay. It's hard to tell, but that's good. <laughs> good. Good. And what's this out here? Probably not fibrous proliferation, but yes, avascular retinas, so where the retinal vessels have not yet extended. That's very good. And then what about in the, this is the right eye. Okay. Good. Good. Okay, so that's a, a good way of assessing it, right? That mm -hmm. Great. Okay, good. And then Russell, what would you describe this this kind of vasculature here? Good. Okay, good. So, so we'll just go over that, and, and uh, Brian talked about this already. So zone one is considered if a circle um, centered on the optic nerve, and the radius of that circle is twice the distance between the optic nerve and where you think the fovea would be. And of course, the fovea is not mature, so it's hard to do that. And a way to clinically assess it is to um, uh, center your image of the retina using a 28 diopter lens and an indirect ophthalmoscope on the optic nerve. And if any of the vessels in any clock hour falls inside that circle, it's considered zone one. So you can see there can be a lot of variation in zone one. You may just have one little notch of a vessel, and that can be very different than if you have all the vasculature within zone one. And then zone two is this circle with the radius from the optic nerve to the aura serrata, and zone three is the um, outside crescent left over. Oops, and stage 
stages, just to go over, stage one is just a faint line. Stage two is a ridge that has volume. If you were able to boil the pressure, you would see that it sticks up into the vitreous cavity. Stage three is extraretinal neovascularization, so blood vessel growth into the vitreous. And in um, research terms, we call that intravitreal neovascularization, and you'll see that, that uh, I'll talk about that a little later. Stage four is a partial retinal detachment, so this is when you start to get fibrovascular changes in the retina, and it can be divided into A or B, depending on whether or not the macula is involved, and B, the macula is involved. And then stage, fi stage five is total retinal detachment, and I'll show you a picture of that later. So, um, so we have the zones and stages of these eyes, so it's probably zone, posterior zone two, uh, stage two to three with plus disease. And so what's the broad classification of that? What would we de describe that? How about Ron? What would you call that? If you have a kid who's um, got plus disease in zone two with stage two to three. Type Good, okay. So type one ROP. And, and from the, na uh, the early treatment retinopathy prematurity study, we know that the natural history of type one ROP, and actually it's, it was proven, but <laughs> that 15%, there's a 15% risk of an adverse outcome, which can include stage five retinopathy prematurity with total retinal detachment. Now this is a picture of that. So we have a clear cornea, we've got some posterior synechia, the iris on the lens. It looks like there's a cataract, but that lens is actually crystal clear. And behind that lens is a total retinal detachment with a fibrovascular membrane. And even with successful surgery of these eyes, and that's very difficult to achieve, the visual outcome's poor. So we want to prevent stage five ROP. So what are the, some of the treatments of type one ROP? The standard of care based on the early treatment retinopathy prematurity study is laser ablation of the peripheral avascular retina. And this is an example of what that can look like. But there was a recent clinical trial um, that tested an anti-VEGF agent called bevacizumab for zone one, stage three plus ROP. And that trial found that in those eyes, there was um, better, out, there were, there, it, it was less likely that you would need repeat surgery, um, meaning repeat laser or uh, anti-VEGF treatment. After anti-VEGF treatment, then um, if those eyes had been treated with laser. So it was only for that subgroup of eyes where they found a significant improvement of anti-VEGF over laser. And, and actually, why would you consider anti-VEGF <coughs> treatment? Well, you know, when early uh, preclinical studies were done looking at anti-VEGF in adult diseases, some of the models that are used, the animal models, are oxygen-induced retinopathy models. And those models have similarities to what we see in retinopathy prematurity. And those models found that VEGF was a causative agent of um, abnormal pa pathologic intravitreal neovascularization and that using a number of different methods to inhibit VEGF reduced pathologic neovascularization. We also found that, that if you can restore VEGF receptor 2 signaling, so VEGF is a ligand that binds to its receptor, if you can re restore the signaling to physiologic levels, you actually cause the, the cleavage planes of the dividing endothelial cells to become ordered so that it promotes vascularization into the retina rather than having the blood vessels or the endothelial cells um, divide on top of each other and get access into the vitreous. So that's at least the hypothesis that we had. And there's also, besides that, experimental evidence that physiologic retinal vascularization is not inhibited compared to control. So so inhibiting VEGF, which is an angiogenic agent, you could say, well, okay, I'm inhibiting pathologic angiogenesis, but in a premature infant, the retinal vasculature is still developing. So it's probably, wouldn't it also inhibit normal vascularization? And at least the experimental evidence suggests it doesn't at certain doses. And that may be that if you can restore physiologic VEGF receptor 2 signaling, you actually can promote normal vascularization and inhibit pathologic. However, since that study, there were a number of reports that were very concerning. 
of persistent avascular retina, recurrent neovascularization, even stage five retinopathy of prematurity reported up to a year after treatment with one intravitreal dose of anti-VEGF. And the, um, th this is unusual because the natural history after laser treatment, usually we think of kids being in the clear at about 54 weeks post-gestational age, so you know that's much lower than a year after treatment. So people thought, well, maybe it's just that anti-VEGF is somehow changing the natural history, and it's just that you, you know, in laser you're already ablating that avascular retina, and you're not doing that when you give anti-VEGF, so that avascular retina is still a stimulus that's promoting the production of more VEGF and therefore pathologic angiogenesis. So we just need to change the way that we follow these kids. So that was one thought. However, then there were these studies that showed that when you give an intravitreal anti-VEGF agent, you reduce the serum VEGF levels for at least two weeks. And I just came back from a meeting where it was eight weeks. That was what was reported in the study. And VEGF is a survival factor, not only for endothelial cells, an important in retinal vascular development, but it's also a neuroprotective agent. So there were concerns about this and what effects it might have on a developing premature infant. And then we also looked in an animal model that was representative of our ROP, you know, what would happen if we used a neutralizing antibody to rat, we use a rat model, rat VEGF, um, and it, follow it over time. So what we found is we could significantly inhibit intravitreal neovascularization, but if we followed those animals at a later time point, they developed recurrent neovascularization into the vitreous, and it was atypical looking. It was these plaque-like areas as opposed to the typical intravitreal neovascularization we see. And it occurred in association with like a rebound of increased signaling through VEGF, but also other angiogenic pathways, including erythropoietin, suggesting that if we gave more anti-VEGF treatment, like what we do in adults, it wouldn't affect, it wouldn't treat it. We would only be making the situation worse. So I just want to get back and, and remind us all how, what, because I'm going to be using terminology and I can visualize it, so I think it sort of helps to <laughs> if I can share a, a picture with everyone. So VGF has a number of family members. We're going to talk about VEGFA. And there actually are at least three different receptors and then co-receptors as well, these neuropylins. The ligand, that's VEGF, binds to its receptor and then it causes these biochemical effects in the receptor that's inside the cell that then can trigger signaling through pathways within the cell and then that leads to biologic effects such as angiogenesis. And we're going to talk about VEGFA because that's, that's the one that's angiogenic or thought to be the, that the most is known about the angiogenesis right now. And we're also going to be probably focusing on VEGF receptor 2, which is really the uh, receptor that's thought to be uh, the angiogenic receptor. We also need to remember that there are a lot of different cell types in the retina. And, you, you know, when you're giving an antibody to VEGF, you're binding the ligand so it can't get to the receptor in any of these cell types. So we're not only talking about the endothelial cells, which have, um, which have VEGF receptor 2, but VEGF receptor 2 is also found on Mueller cells, it's found on neurons, it's found on ganglion cells and other cells. So it can have other effects. So we came up with the hypothesis that if we could target the cells that overproduce VEGF in the retina, that we would safely reduce intravitreal neovascularization without inhibiting normal vascular development. And that if we knock down a splice variant of VEGF, VEGF-164, it would be safer than knocking down all of the VEGFA compounds. Now, we can't experiment on premature infants. And so we must use representative animal models. And the information that we learn from adults is not the same as what happens in a premature infant, especially in the eye and probably also in the body. So we use a representative model of retinopathy of prematurity developed by John Penn. It's called the RAT5010 oxygen-induced retinopathy model, and it looks like type 1 ROP. 
It develop, it, there's a delay in physiologic retinal vascular development and this area of intravitreal neovascularization that occurs at the junction of the vascular and avascular retina. So these are flat mounds taken from rat pup eyes. The optic nerve is in the center because rats don't have maculas. The vasculature is stained with lectin so we can visualize it. And because the eye is round, when you flatten it out, it comes out looking like a clover leaf, unlike the circles that we draw. So the other reason that we use, uh, the, other, the other reasons why the rat model is representative of human ROP is that the, the uh, pups and their moms are placed into a cycled oxygen environment and these oxygen levels translate to arterial oxygen levels in the rat pups that are similar to what human preterm and infants that develop type 1 ROP uh, experience. So the, the oxygen model, uh, the, the oxygen that uh, the inspired oxygen causes uh, arterial oxygen similar to what preterm infants have. It also uses oxygen fluctuation, which is becoming more thought to be important in severe retinopathy of prematurity. And the model creates extra uterine growth restriction, which is also a risk factor for ROP. So historically, this has been a you know, a great model to use, but because it's in rat, we can't use transgenic animals easily. And so it was hard to study genetic mechanisms. But in this, we, we've um, addressed this problem now. So we previously found out in the rat model the time points when VEGF was increased in the model. And we found that it occurred actually earlier you know, around postnatal day 12. So earlier than here's where intravitreal neovascularization occurs. And here at postnatal day 25, that's where regression of disease usually starts. So these are the two time points I'll be talking about. So VEGF actually is expressed earlier in the model than when we see the neovascularization. So then we wanted to find out where the VEGF message was. So where the mRNA, what cells were actually producing VEGF. And so we did in situ hybridization, which is a way of visualizing where the message is. And so here are the different splice variants of VEGF. This is through the mRNA. And we see that VEGF is in the RPE, it's in sort of the photoreceptor outer segments here, and in the inner nuclear layer. So the Mueller cells have been discussed by other people that that, th that it, they may be the ones that are expressing pathologic amounts of VEGF as well. And so we wanted to target Mueller cell VEGF. And we used a lentivector gene therapy strategy to target overexpressed VEGF in Mueller cells only. So this was a novel lentivector that we developed in the lab. But we did it through collaboration with a lot of experts. So we designed and tested several shRNA short hairpin RNAs to VEGF A, VEGF 164, or luciferase, which is a non-mammalian gene and serves as a control. And we tested the efficiency in reporter cell lines that overexpressed some of the splice variants. And we also test the specific specificity to <laughs> Mueller cells in a cell line and also in vivo. Now, we, John Flannery had developed a plasmid that has a CD44 promoter that targets Mueller cells only. And so we, the, and it has a GFP, so it has green fluorescent protein tagged with it. So we can see where that um, lentivector with this plasmid would get into the, where it would go, that it would go to the Mueller cells. One of the problems or the challenges is that CD44 requires polymerase II to be, to be expressed and to be driven. And the polymerase II is not really that efficient at driving shRNA. So in order to get by that uh, problem, we had the um, shRNAs embedded within a microRNA30 construct. So it's not a microRNA, but it's within that construct, with ma which makes it more efficient to be able to drive the target shRNA and GFP. So we put this all together, put them into lentivectors, and then that took six years. And now the next slide, okay? <laughs> and then, uh, so here are some pictures, because pictures, I think, are more fun than words. And so what we see here is this shows that first the top shows that we are able to transduce Mueller cells 
Um, so here's PBS. So, so the, this lenti vector is given as a subretinal injection at postnatal day eight in the rat pups. PBS, we don't see, and these are micron images in live animals. So no GFP, but for luciferase, which is a control, we see good GFP of the Mueller cell and feet and also the VEGFA sHRNA. Now we want that. We want the control to show GFP so we know that we actually were able to transduce Mueller cells. And then this is a cross section showing a, G, a CRALBP labeled Mueller cell co-labeled with GFP. And then here, this just shows that when we took the, the retinas out and measured them for VEGF, this is uninjected room air, so this is kind of in development. We see that there's a significant reduction in the VEGF levels by the VEGFA shRNA compared to PBS injection or to luciferase injection as a control. So the first thing we wanted to do now that we had the tool was to determine the effect of targeted knockdown of VEGFA by, in Mueller cells on the natural, the, the capillaries, the developing normal physiologic capillaries of the retina and compare it to when we use an anti-VEGF antibody. Because we had found that the previously that the anti-VEGF antibody had recurrent neovascularization and that um, it also um, upregulated other angiogenic pathways besides the EGF. So we, tar we uh, collaborated with uh, Brian Jones in, uh, here at Moran, and we used a synchro scan. So here it just gives an example. This is a flat mount of retina that's labeled with um, lectin. And then we, we were able, even though it looks like two different colors, this is just dividing out um, by looking at different planes in the z-axis, the inner plexus and the deep plexus. So we were able to actually measure the inner and deep plexi uh, in this model. So then we, we wanted to st study the, the effect in two different ways. So classically, we just measure the amount of vascular to total retina when we think of the effect on capillaries, on physiologic vascularization. But that doesn't get a capillary density as well as actually measuring the pixels of fluorescence. So we use two different methods. We looked at extent, we called it extent of vascularization of to total vascularization, and we looked at the pixels of fluorescence to the total retinal area, okay? And we compared the anti-VEGF to its control and the SRH, shRNA to VEGFA to its control. And Haibo Wang really spearheaded this. She's a research assistant professor in my laboratory. And what we found, what she found, was that the vascular coverage, the way that we would, you know, classically measure the amount of um, the effect on the retinal vascularization, was not affected. Uh, there was no difference in each treatment compared to its respective control. However, when we looked at capillary density, the anti-VEGF here significantly reduced capillary uh, density compared to its respective control in both the inner and deep plexus. We also looked at the angles of the cleavage planes and basically when, when the, these are two, this is a mitotic figure that it, it's actually a drawing, but it represents a mitotic figure during anaphase that's been labeled with uh, antiphosphohistone uh, H3, which is an antibody that shows us the two dividing um, in, in mitosis, the daughter cells. And the angle predicts whether the vessel's elongated, widened, or irregular or disordered. And we found that the targeted knockdown of VEGF reduced the number of mitotic figures and restored angiogenesis. So it does, it, it, it gave us more uh, evidence to support that hypothesis. The targeted knockdown did not have an adverse effect on physiologic va vascularization, did not reduce vascular density in the inner and deep plexi, whereas the anti-VEGF did, and it may induce capillary plexus dropout, leading to hypoxic stimulus for recurrent intravitreal neovascularization. So that's the hypothesis we developed from this experiment. We also, though, thought that maybe vascular coverage, like what we see when we look in a premature infant eye, may not be sufficient to measure safety of what's going on in the retina. 
So then we look at the second part of the hypothesis, and this is about whether VEGF-164 knockdown would be safer than VEGF-A knockdown. And again, this is just showing micron images that we can target the Mueller cells um, with our control and the two shRNAs. And this shows that we can significantly knock down VEGF in the retina compared to the control luciferase. And we looked at two time points, postnatal day 18 when intravitreal neovascularization peaks and postnatal day 25 when we often see regression of neovascularization. And so this is what we found. So on the top, these are, these are flat mounts stained with lectin, and we see that postnatal day 18, either the VEGF-A shRNA or the VEGF-164 shRNA significantly reduced intravitreal neovascularization compared to control. But at day 25, only the VEGF-164 shRNA maintained that inhibition. And that's what we see in the bottom row and also right here. <laughs> here. And there was no effect on avascular area of retina, which is th how the readout for the um, coverage or vascular extent. So as I said, we're, we're knocking down VEGF-A in Mueller cells, and so we were interested in what was going on in receptor tube signaling and endothelial cells. So we did immunohistochemistry of sections of the retina, co-labeled with lectin, that stains endothelial cells and phosphorylated VEGF receptor two, so the activated form of the receptor. And what we found was that that P, P18, postnatal day 18, that each lentivector significantly reduced signaling through the VEGF receptor two and endothelial cells, but at day 25, only the VEGF 164, or, or it did not have an increase in receptor two signaling. So this may account for some of that um, persistent neovascularization that we saw on the previous slide. And this was really done by Yan Chao Jiang, who was uh, in my lab and who has now moved on. So it's not surprising to have glial cells <coughs> produce the ligands that trigger signaling through endothelial cells. And so it, it, in nori disease, for example, um, or norin, which is the protein that's affected by nori disease, which causes a, a blindness in mainly males. Um, norin is produced by Mueller cells, and it triggers signaling through receptors in the endothelial cells, FRISL4 and LRP5. And this kind of uh, scenario is common in a number of ligand and receptor pairs. But we also have to remember that VEGF can affect other cells. As I said, Mueller cells, ganglion cells, RPE, photoreceptors. And so we looked at safety. Now, this, these are sections. DAPI just labels the nuclei. And then tunnel is a stain that uh, is used to represent cells or to uh, visualize cells that are dying. They can die through apoptosis or necrosis. And what we see here is after subretinal injections at postnatal day 8, at postnatal day 18, the VEGF-A shRNA causes more disruption of the layers of the retina and increased number of tunnel positive cells compared to either the VEGF-164 shRNA or control. And at day 25, everything looks like it's okay. However, if you look at the thickness of the inner and outer nuclear layer, we found that the VEGF-A actually causes thinning of the outer nuclear layer at both day 18 and day 25, suggesting that VEGF-A in Mueller cells may have an important effect on survival in the photoreceptors and that when you inhibit it, you may be affecting photoreceptor health. But we need to look at function. And then importantly, there were no differences in serum VEGF or body weight gain in these animals. So in conclusion with our research part, we were a we were able to specifically target Mueller cell overexpressed VEGF-A or a splice variant of VEGF in the rat. And that's, that's new, that's novel. We found that intravitreal neovascularization was significantly inhibited by either lentivector shRNA, but only sustained with the VEGF-164 shRNA. And that knockdown of Mueller cell VEGF-A, but not 164, caused cell death and thinned the outer nuclear layer. And neither of these affected physiologic retinal vascular development, serum VEGF, or body weight. 
But I think there are some things that we can take away from this and maybe consider when we think about the premature. So let's bring it back to the clinic. So maybe targeted knockdown of overexpressed VEGF164 may be safer for the developing retina. You know, we don't know, and some of this could still be a dose effect. But some of the soluble forms, the secreted forms of VEGF, are not affected by inhibiting VEGF-164. So those secreted forms may be able to get to the ganglion cells and the photoreceptors and other cells and maintain their health. Um, assessing body weight gain, serum VEGF, recurrence of neovascularization or vascular coverage may not be sufficient to test safety because all those parameters were not affected in our study. And yet we found significant differences in the effects on the retina. But we need to do studies on structure and function. And so we've, we're hoping that we're, we're funded to continue doing those studies. So we've refined a relevant ROP model and made it rigorous to study molecular mechanism. And our plan now is actually to start to target the uh, receptors at the endothelial cell level and to try to specifically inhibit the um, overactivated VEGF receptor 2 there to normalize its <coughs> physiologic uh, states. So let's go back to the baby girl, <laughs> LB then. So she was 34 to 35 weeks post-gestational age. The thought was it was posterior zone 2 with stage 2 to 3 plus disease, and the broad diagnosis Ron had said was type 1 ROP. So they're clear media, um, not stage 3 plus, not zone 1. So the decision was to treat this with laser. And so we, she had laser treatment of the peripheral avascular retina, and then weekly follow-up for progressive stage 4 ROP, or continued vascular activity. So just as, just this, um, as a clinical um, reminder, I guess, so when you have, when you treat with laser, you, you want to see that at one week after laser that it's not worse. At two weeks, you'd like to see some regression of disease. In type 1, many times you see regression much earlier than that. But as the baby um, becomes older in post-gestational age to about 38 to 42 weeks post-gestational age, there is a change where you start to see fibrovascular change. And at that point, if there's, even if there's plus disease, if there's not neovascularization, those cases can go on to develop retinal detachment and they're treated with surgery. Laser won't help that. But if you still have neovascular activity, meaning intravitreal neovascularization of stage 3 and plus disease, prior to those times that you see the fibrous change, then laser can work. So practically, what do we do? If I see vascular activity, so not just plus disease, but I see <coughs> still stage 3 present, then I try laser, especially if there's skip lesion. Because if you can prevent the need for surgery, that's better. But at some point, you make a decision to go in because as that, um, in stage 4 ROP, the, the uh, fibrous tissue comes up to the lens, and you get to a point where it's very difficult to go in and, and not hurt the lens. And you want to keep the lens in these kids because they have a better chance for visual rehabilitation. So th this was the plan with her, and, and what happened was, and I'm told she's continuing to regress. So after laser, you can see the laser treatment. You can see that there, there, at least in these pictures, there do not appear to be areas of skip lesions. And she's had uh, resolving plus disease and persistent, some persistent ridge. But as I understand, that's going away as well. OK, so she was treated with laser. But when do you consider anti-VEGF treatment? And what treatments do you use? because there may be times where, where this is used. And according to the American Academy of Pediatrics and Ophthalmology, there may be cases where anti-VEGF uh, agents have to be used in order to prevent blindness. And so they came out with a statement um, in pediatrics in January of 2013. And these were the recommendations. They recommended bevacizumab because it's the only anti-VEGF agent that's been tested in a clinical mm -hmm. trial so far. So we don't have, we only have series of cases with ranibizumab. We don't have controls. Neither, bevacizumab's not FDA approved for the eye. So it's really important to have a de detailed informed <coughs> consent when you talk with the parents. 
It's only to be used for zone one, stage three plus ROP, so not zone two ROP. This is, these are from the recommendation. And it's used when other things kind of preclude <coughs> your ability to treat with laser, because laser is the standard of care based on the large ETROP trial. And there, there were a lot of concerns about the, the clinical trial with anti-VEGF treatment. Other requirements, weekly examinations until the retina becomes fully vascularized. So this is uh, because the anti-VEGF can cause persistent avascular retina even a year after treatment. It's important to have a log with the dates of treatment and who the treating physician was, and then good communication between the treating and receiving teams upon discharge of the infant or transfer to another NICU. So it's really critical that these kids not be lost because they if they have persistent avascular retina, it is conceivable that that provides a hypoxic stimulus for new VEGF and other angiogenic factors, and then that can lead to uh, retinal detachment. We don't know the right dose. We don't know the type of anti-VEGF agent to use or the effect on safety. So that those are still questions. And I think it's really important to think about this. These are recommendations based on regions in which oxygenation of the infants is regulated. So we're talking about the United States. Um, there are countries, emerging developing countries, that are able to save preterm infants who are using 100% oxygen and recreating the ROP that the United States saw in the 1950s and 60s. And those countries, the babies tend to be bigger. They might develop the um, ROP at 36 weeks gestation, you know, big birth weight babies. Yes, what we need to do is not have them give 100% oxygen. But for the babies that do have that and develop ROP, where they don't have people treating with laser, we just don't know. I mean, maybe anti-avascular is the way to do it. We don't want blind babies to, you know, sometimes you can't solve all the problems all at once. So those are things to consider when you're making this decision. So anyway, that, that is what I wanted to, and then I wanted to talk a little about some of the other studies that we have ongoing in pediatric retina. We have a lot of the team members here, and I'm so glad that everyone could come, but does anyone have any question right now about this, about any of the, the VEGF or the studies that we did? Yes, Leah. <laughs> Right, you, you know, that's an excellent question. Um, so I'm told that Mike Tracy did a study with Macugen, but I don't think it's ever been reported, but Mike talks about it and he says it doesn't work at all. But he also says that they gave Macugen right around 36 to 37 weeks post-gestational age, and that's right at the time where you're starting to get the fibrovascular change, so you can get the crunch phenomenon sim similar to what you see in diabetic retinopathy when you give anti-VEGF treatment. And then the other thing, it's, it's, it's an aptamer, so I'm not sure that it would be, I, I'm not exactly sure how it works in comparison to other mechanisms to deliver anti-VEGF. Yes, Barb. Right. Right, correct. And one is coming through the very end of the human. So if you have the hematic mass and you have to stop putting the mass in the retina, it will still generate a hunting mass in here if it ever needs to go. And there is literature data in the first step in the compound that Tony did mm -hmm. where they looked at molecular that can be inserted. Right, and maybe, I, I keep thinking it might be that a different way of approaching the drug <coughs> delivery or the, the way to target it might be useful. Yes? Um, some of our concerns in the laboratory are the mm -hmm. type of protein that we can provide. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of other organs that right. that are needed, including the pancreas and some of the other organs that we need. So having one or more is a good way to target a given protein. So 
so yeah, that's a that's a good question. So we have collected the the organs, so <laughs> we haven't looked at it yet, but that is what we want to do. And also look at the brain. I think with Joanna and, and maybe Shrana Patel too, we were going to do sections and also Bob DiGeronimo. I think all that we talked about it, um, I think it's just a matter of it, it, we have tissue. Do we have, Hybo, do we have tissue that, like the brain, where we can section it and give to people? Oh, we just have the hypothalamus. Should we be doing, giving something else, a whole brain? I mean, and, and should we try to do it for sections or should we do it for Westerns? Okay. Do, do we know how to do that? Do we know how to collect it? Great. Okay, good. That would be great, Camille. <laughs> and yeah, great. Thanks. So I've always been really cautious because of the effects on the systemic. So I, I don't think it has, but this is my approach. You know, I, I, I try to uh, dilate the baby. If I can't get good dilation, I use atropine if, as long as it's okay with neonatology. And sometimes I use topical steroids to, to reduce some of the, the haze and the angiogenesis that way by reducing inflammation. At least because a lot of times they'll have Angiogenesis, as you know, is the tunica vasculosa lentis or vascularization that makes it really hard to see in the back. And then, and then it's like, it's like what I say to people when you get a neovascular glaucoma. It used to be where we had to do treatment with laser. It's like you sit down for a long winter night. You just say, okay, we're going to do the laser and treat, and try to get as much in. And sometimes repeat treatment you know, is needed, especially in the zone one cases because there can be flat neovascularization, as you know, that regresses and shows us new stick lesions. But it's very difficult to tell what's flat neovascularization versus what's normal vascularization. Now, if a kid came in that I couldn't treat, I would, I would recommend or consider it, certainly. But I, I, you know, I think it's a sledgehammer. I think it's more of a sledgehammer than laser, actually, because it affects so much of the kid. Right. And, and otherwise, those kids would be blind, probably, or some of them would be, right? So, I, you know, I hope, that, I hope that they're following the kids and making sure that they vascularize, and if they don't, maybe treating with laser. And I hope that they're keeping track, somebody is keeping track of what's happening as best they can. Yeah, well, <coughs> I'd be curious to hear what you find from them. And I want to ask to the neonatologist, because one of the questions that comes up when we talk about this, the pediatric retina surgeons meeting, is, well, how, wh you know, how can we tell whether or not a premature infant who, you know, the premature infants who get our OP are the ones who also get cerebral palsy and, right, and poly, like, 
occurs on trachealar local mal malacia. So they have a lot of problems going on. How do you tell whether or not the effects on development are from anti-VEGF versus premature birth? I mean, you know, it's. Yeah. Well, I think beet, beet rot, so not beet rot, um, what is it called? Block rot, right? I think there is, David Wallace from Duke is um, now the chair of PDIG. Bob, tell me if I'm wrong. And, and he was very interested in the block rot study, which we had submitted to NEI and did not get funding for. But through PDIG, which is the Pediatric Eye Disease, yeah, and, and is very well respected by NEI. Um, he's organizing a trial. So we're, Bob and I will be, and David and whoever else will be involved, hopefully with that as well. Yes, so that's the question. Thank you. I'm just trying to explain it a little bit in some ways. <laughs> Thank you. I'm really interested in this experiment that all of these patients are downstream of not closely with the population of the cancer group. So right. Good, thank you. So let me just, I'll just move on then and show you some of the other things that we're doing because um, we've got a wonderful team and it's just such a privilege to work here. I can't tell you how much I've really enjoyed my move. So, um, you know, we are doing optical coherence tomography and prematurity and retinopathy of prematurity. And we're doing this as a um, sort of, as an, in, as our Moran slash University of Utah slash primary um, <coughs> um, children's medical center kind of group and, and also as part as a, um, as one site in a study that's going into NEI as a U grant hopefully at the end of the year to study the hypothesis that we can use OCT images to predict infants at risk of severe ROP earlier than ophthalmologic examinations. And I will also say that this grant right now is also considering looking at OCT images predicting neurodevelopment. So because there are changes that occur in the cupping of the optic nerve, so there are other things that are being seen that may be useful in telling us which infants are more at risk of neural development, neural developmental problems. So the, the lead is at Duke right now. And the goal is to under also, our, my goal too, is to understand the relationship of the retinal structure determined by OCT and visual and neural development. So, you know, the, because we're seeing that things are different in premature infants. So these are some images. So Glenn and Siri, um, Paula and Jim and Mel, our photographers are really, I mean, being able to take images of premature infants by handheld OCT in the NICU while the infants are awake. And, and we also have the whole neonatal nursing group. We have neonatologists that are, that are supporting this. And so here are some images that we see and what we see that are kind of different. So this is the macular region. This is actually the fovea. There's hardly any uh, indentation of the fovea. And you can just kind of see some of the cysts here. Now, the image quality would be better if we averaged all the images, but this is just raw data. And, and then here, where we do actually see a foveal indentation, you see that there are retained layers of the retinal. So, you know, during development, when you develop the fovea in the, um, like, inner plexiform and other layers kind of move out, they migrate out, and the cone, you get cone density uh, packing that occurs. So we see these kind of persistent layers here, the inner plexiform layer. And so those are the kinds of things that we're looking at. There's also reduced um, photoreceptor segment um, um, length that occurs. So that's one of the things that we're doing and getting on board. 
We're also looking at genetic and epigenetic associations with prematurity, retinopathy of prematurity and severe IOP in uh, combination with Meg DeAngelis and her lab. We're starting to um, um, obtain cords from premature infants <coughs> and from full-term infants through the help and the coordination of the Primary Children Medical Center and University uh, nurse practitioners. So we have collaboration there through the help of Brad Yoder, Joanna Bucci, Roger Fakes, and uh, Tanyos, Bob DiGeronimo are involved in that as well. And we, we're in collaborating with the Neonatal Research Network nationally to understand genetic variants associated with severe ROP. And then we're looking at the structural features of neural retina by OCT in association with genetic mutations in other pediatric retina conditions. And Mimi Young and um, my fellows, Ron Hobb and Nick Batra, are working on that. So I, I'd like to, and those are some of the studies. We're also trying to get into developing um, animation to be able to explain to parents and family members what goes on in some of these complex retinal diseases. Because, you know, when you think about it, we show flat images of a sphere where we have these complex things affecting over time. And we explain to people, well, these blood vessels are growing here, or these blood vessels are growing here. But if we had animation where we could show three dimension over time, it may be very useful in improving the education and, and helping parents understand what's going on. So I wanted to acknowledge my funding sources, but especially people in my lab and my collaborators, <coughs> Haibo here, who's up in front. And um, actually, we have, we have to get a new uh, picture <laughs> because we've had a whole new uh, change in the laboratory. And also Brian Jones, who's so helpful with the Synchroscan and the studies doing that. Um, and also, I want to acknowledge all our, our cl clinical uh, team with pediatric ophthalmology, the retina clinic, photography, clinical studies that help us so much with the IRBs, genetic counseling, uh, primary children's medical center, Moran surgery, the teams of the neonatal nurse practitioners at both the UUMC and TCMC, occupational therapy, which is now helping us perform um, examinations on babies without causing them so much stress, all the neonatologists at Utah, Meg DeAngelis in lab, and Vanessa Shannon, who's my um, assistant, and then Cindy Toth at Duke as well. So thank you very much. <laughs> and if anyone wants to be involved in any of those, just please, we're always looking for people to help. Thank you. Thank you.